Now, throughout the last videos, we actually talked about how evolution leads to variety in the population. And one of the interesting things that actually creates variety within the same species is the idea of sexual selection. And this is actually very cool in biology, and so let's talk a little bit about it. Ever wonder why sometimes the girls do what girls do and why boys do what boys do? Now, it's much more complex than we're going to talk about in other animals when it comes to humans. But there certainly seems to be pressure on some genders to look better and also some pressures from people to perform better that's why we use things like makeup that's like why we work out that's why we like to have good jobs that's why we have paternal uh, figures and guys that's why girls have to look uh, maternal that's why there seems to be a certain thing about symmetry in humans that we like symmetry that you know we think that faces which are very symmetric are very pretty and we also like faces with certain proportions that fill the golden rule we think that's actually good all of that because our brains make an instinctive connection between those features and, pop and the viability of this organism in producing offspring that's going to survive. And it's instinctive. We see beauty as an actual ticket towards having offspring that actually is going to be awesome as well. And that's why there's actually data that suggests that a certain female figure or a certain proportion of waist to hip ratio indicates more virility in the female or more likelihood of the female actually to carry babies to term. And that's why the proportion of there is important. Likewise, the males which are stronger, which are richer, which are smarter, are more attractive because they're also going to be indications that this may be someone who's going to be able to take care of children or going to be able to provide for children but it's much more complex than that in humans in fact there's pressure on both genders to look good there's pressure on both genders to be providers but when it comes down to animals it's going to be a lot different it's going to depend on the role of each gender within the species sometimes it's the male that takes care of the offspring and so the female is going to be looking for a male that's actually very caregiving or that seems to have the features which are going to be enhance the, ch the chances of the offspring to be able to survive uh, males which are better hunters maybe males which are stronger maybe males which are faster and all of these things will be selected for likewise females which are seem to have indications they will produce a lot of offspring which are going to survive are also going to be uh, selective by the males and so there's different pressures on each gender depending on the job that each gender does there's a lot of variation on this in life, but in a lot of cases, it is the female that chooses the male. And even in humans, it's kind of like that. I like to think that it's like that, that it's the girls that have the power. The guys always have the last word, but it's always yes, men. And it's because the female is the one that puts the pressure on the selection of the males. And it's typically the males that have to compete with each other for the females. And it's kind of like how it is in nature. And especially in humans where a lot more females tend to survive than males, which have tougher jobs and which have more fragile pregnancies and in infancies and even jobs throughout their lives and so most of the males will die more often than females do pregnancies will fail they'll, they'll die more often during birth they'll die more often during childhood they'll die more often during adolescence and even during adulthood so when everything is said and done there's a lot more females than males in the population and it's as it should be because you don't need that many males because one male can inseminate many females but you need a lot of females because they're the ones who are going to be carrying the eggs and that's actually true for a lot of, of animals in the population females are usually the ones that actually carry the eggs or to lay the eggs or care for the eggs in the case of mammals they even carry the actual baby to term and and also take care of them in the first months or years of their life and so females are usually the ones that are going to be making the choice of the mate or the males but they're going to be looking for certain things in the males being a better hunter being a better provider and things like that females are more choosy than males that doesn't mean necessarily though that females are going to be monogamous all right in fact there's a lot of examples of birds where your female is going to be a very very uh, the contrary females will mate with several males sometimes they'll even store sperm from seven different males and then inseminate different eggs with the sperm from different males and so to enhance the variation it's in its offspring but it also so it's very interesting that even birds that do that end up choosing one bird to be the one that cares for their babies and it's funny because that bird doesn't even know if all the babies are his but he still takes care of them because you know he knows that there's a chance that at least a few of the babies are his and since he's sticking with the female there's a higher chance that the babies are his so it's an advantage for him to kind of stick around and take care of the babies but it doesn't mean that girls will be monogamous but there's a lot of animals which are actually monogamous will pair up for life a lot of polygamous males though in nature because you know the males are getting like I said can inseminate several females but uh, but polygamy and monogamy in in actual uh, animals is going to be very very diversified depending on the situation some males will mate with several females some females will be very males and but sometimes you'll see monogamy happening the same thing is true about humans you know that we have this pr push for monogamy because we like the idea 
of enhancing the chances of our offspring to be our offspring, this morality actually came from the evolutionary pressure, the same pressure that's in some animals. And but on the other hand, we also like polygamy because in a way it increases our chances of variety, you know, of spreading our seeds and mess, making different kinds of crosses. So we have a little bit of both. Try to be polygamous even as we try to appear monogamous. And that's actually the reality of the population. This complexity that exists in types of behaviors and in types of looks all stems from the kinds of pressure that the genders are under. And that's what we call sexual dimorphism, when the genders act or look different because of different pressure that's put on the genders. For, for both monogamy or polygamy, for choosing or being chosen, for competing or being the one that actually initiates the competition, for being the one that carries the children or the one that cares for the children, or the one that has to be bigger or tougher to protect the offspring, or the one who has to be tougher to in order to do the hunting, the one that has to maintain the integrity of the group. Here comes the idea of alpha males because they have the, la the larger likelihood of having sexual encounters. All of these complex behaviors that occur in nature with the males and females sometimes have to do with the different kinds of pressure that they're put under. Which is why they look and act different because they're under different pressures. Before we talk about that in more detail, I want to go over the idea of primary versus secondary sexual equipment. Now primary sexual equipment is the equipment that's directly related to the act of sex and to the physiology of actually having a baby or making a baby. So things like penises, vaginas in the mammals are going to be things which are primary sexual characteristics because these are things which have to do with the actual intercourse or the actual act of carrying the baby to term. So anything that's different between a male and a female because of the different roles of those species in the actual sexual event is actually called primary sexual characteristics. So clearly the human males and human females are different. The mammal glands of females are more developed because they are the ones which actually have to feed the babies in the first days or months of their lives. Then you also have the fact that males are going to be the ones inseminating the females so they will have penises to, to do the internal fertilization process. And females have to have vaginas and uteruses in, ma in mammals because they're the ones carrying the baby to term. The situation might be different in something like a seahorse where the male is the one that carries the eggs. You know, they're not really mammals but they're the ones that actually carry and lay the eggs so the structure is going to be different there. And so depending on what kind of sexual behavior or sexual morphology or physiology exists in the species, they will look different from each other because they'll be doing different jobs. And that's primary sexual equipment. Secondary sexual equipment is equipment or changes or variation that exists between males and females that has absolutely nothing to do with survival or with the actual act of having children, but it has to do with enhancing your chances of being picked as a mate. In other words, it's equipment that evolved from what we call sexual pressure or sexual selection. Now the idea here is that these things are not necessarily going to enhance the animal's chances of survival. It doesn't necessarily makes the animal stronger, faster, smarter, or poisonous, or anything else that normally enhances the chances of the animal surviving. It's not an adaptation that has anything to do with reproductive fitness in the sense of surviving or having more offspring or living longer or any of those things. It actually has to do with actually being chosen as a mate. So these are things that develop from sexual pressure or from the pressure that's put on them to actually look presentable. The idea here is that animals that have sophisticated sexual features and behaviors will actually have a high correlation with their actual fitness in other respects as well. So for example, when you see a peacock with those very complex feathers and a very complex dance, females interpret that as an indication of the fact that that peacock probably has seed or sperm which will make the offspring also more likely to survive. The idea is if, you, if you're fit enough to have developed sexual characteristics like this and sexual behaviors like this, then you're probably going to be have children which are going to be more fit as well. And you can apply this to humans, you can think about it. Uh, we are constantly looking looking for better mates. We are constantly looking for mates which are richer, better looking, and all these different features because we think that there's a correlation between that and evolutionary intrinsically in our minds we think that it has something to do with how good the children are going to be like as well and how good he's going to be or she's going to be in taking care of those children. And that's why we have the sexual dimorphism because there's differences in the pressure that exists between males and females. Remember, secondary sexual characteristics have everything to do with the pressure that's put on the gender to actually be chosen as the mate. Now, that's why typically males will have more sophisticated sexual features and behaviors than females will have because they are the ones that have to impress the females which are typically the choosers. So whenever you have an animal that's going to be the one that is going to be choosing, a female is going to be choosing, then the male is going to be more complex. Sometimes you have females which are larger than males and that's for a different reason because the females are going to be the one taking care of the young and protecting the young early in life and that's why they're going to be larger or because they're going to actually have to be careful the young. And so that's sometimes why females are stronger, you know, and that's actually true in male, in humans actually. The, hum the females are clearly more genetically adapted because they survive
survive better both in the pregnancy and the childbirth and during the actual lifetime. But I'm kidding, actually, because males also have everything to do with raising children. And, and female, that's not the job of females in humans. In fact, on the contrary, humans actually work together to raise the children. But in the nature, a lot of females are the ones which are doing that. And that's why they're going to be looking tougher sometimes and bigger, as you see in the snakes and on the spider you see in the screen. But all the sophistication that you see in males, including, for example, those frogs, they have those chants and, and cicadas. Or you see the big, big, puffy air sacs that sometimes happen in frogs or other lizards or amphibians. And you also have coloration patterns in, in males of bird species, including, you see three examples here on the screen, including the amazing and flamboyant example of, of the peacock. And also the dances that males do to impress the females, the singing that males do to impress the females. And that's also true in birds. And even also the displays of sexual aggression between males. For example, they use the antlers, again, to impress the females. It's a feature, a physical feature. And then they actually have a behavior, which is fighting, to actually impress the females. And so all of these things, all of this complex, sophisticated in sexual features and behaviors has to do with the fact that there's pressure on the males to be chosen by the females. And that's why also you know the lions have those big manes and so forth. When guys want to have the nice car, the nice job, they want to look good, it's all because they want to be chosen by the girls and when the girls want to look good it's the same thing in, in humans now this sexual dimorphism is controlled by genetic mechanisms that we already learned about first of course there is the fact that some of the genes which will cause males and females are genetically inherited through sex linked genes and that's going to be different depending on the organism because there are different kinds of, of systems to generate the gender uh, but the most famous is the XY system but whatever the sex male sex chromosome combination is, it's going to have genes which will cause the male look to actually come. And these genes will be pleiotropic and it will have multiple effects throughout the body. And the majority of these effects will, will occur through epistatic gene expression control. What that means is that one gene present, for example, the Y chromosome, which produces testosterone in a lot of, of species, although that's not the only control that exists in nature, but that hormone will then activate or deactivate the gene expression of a lot of other genes. And so males will be different from females because they will have different sets of of genes active than the females will have since they lacked the uh, high value of testosterone that is produced by the Y chromosome for example in um, males in humans. You also have epigenetic gene expression control because the males will have different chromosomes active and different genes active than the, the females will have it will, they will be exposed to different parts or different responses to the environment and throughout their development and maturation process this will lead to differences between the two genders as well in, including for example learning because uh, the adults in the population will act a certain way and then the young will learn from the adults how to act and they will learn the patterns of male and female behavior as well because of that. So together these things will cause physiological and psychological changes in body and mind, in the brain and in the body systems that will lead to differences in the way they look and act. And again, of course, this has to do with genetic inheritance of sex-linked genes in whatever specific male sex chromosome combination it is for that species. And the genes in that chromosomes will be pleiotropic and will have epistatic and gene expression control in other genes. And they will also have learning and other types of epigenetic control systems will actually lead to differences between the male and the female in the way they look. And physiological and my psychological changes will occur in body and mind. But how does this process evolve? Uh, why are there differences between males and females? Now, there's two types of pressure that's going to make these kinds of sophisticated behavior and sexual their characteristics to, de to develop. And there's going to be mate choice and competition. Now, competition is intrasexual pressure. That's basically pressure within the gender. When two males will be competing with each other for a female, and that's why you have things like, you know, the behaviors that uh, me evolving and features evolving, which will make them more likely to be the chosen ones. And then you also have intersexual pressure, which is the pressure that exists between males and females. Pressure between the genders and the fact that the females are the ones doing the choice and therefore they're going to be the ones putting the pressure on the males to look better, to look tougher, to look awesomer, you know? And we call this mate choice. And that's basically sexual selection and where there's a lot of variety that exists between genders of the same species 
and why there's sometimes differences between the way that males and females act. And it has everything to do with the jobs that they have in, or the niches of the males and females being different. And about the selectiveness or the choice that each gender has and so forth. And again, pressure, all the forms are, are explained, by, explained by their function in terms of evolutionary terms. And yet another example of how evolution explains everything in life, including sexual dimorphism.